<clears throat> well, hi there. My name is Mark Shepard, and uh, I am the, I guess, proprietor, manager, puppeteer uh, at New Forest Farms and Forest Agriculture Enterprises. Currently, we're right now at uh, the Shepherd's Hard Cider Mill in uh, Viola, Wisconsin, southwest cornerish kind of area of Wisconsin. And uh, New Forest Farm is a 106-acre permaculture design farm that we started uh, almost 20 years ago now and based on the ecological model of the oak savanna. What I really wanted to do was like, like uh, Steve Irwin did. I wanted to be living outdoors doing stuff that's totally dangerous. And so I figured, well, how am I gonna do that? I know, and I, I, can't, I can't just like quit and run away. I've gotta, I gotta get an education because you know, the whole social pressure and all that. So I went back to school for ecology and I graduated two years later uh, right when it was about the time when they were shooting ecologists, I think is what it was. Not only was the job market poor, it was like, you know, negative. And uh, so I took the opportunity to hitchhike west and homestead in Alaska for a whole bunch of years. So I had like my mechanical engineering background and I had my ecology background and then I was out there in the middle of nowhere, 300 miles from town, trying to figure out how do we live on this planet without destroying it and uh, learn quite a bit. It was at, at that time I started writing a book and uh, some guy said, I, I, he was a, a friend of ours, a neighbor of ours who was an English major. I wanted him to edit it for me. What do you think about this book idea? He says, well, that's, you know, it's already been written. It's called permaculture. So I took a permaculture design course and then I started teaching like the specialty blocks with the soils and forests and that kind of stuff at permaculture design courses. And as a, at a design course in 1993, that uh, I had had enough, I had heard enough of these permaculturists talking about with permacultures, we don't need farms, we're gonna grow all our food in our front yard and all these beautiful places where we we're at would all sit down and eat rice and beans for, for our, our meal. Well, but it's organic, it's, it's organic, it's okay. It's like, well, you know, I've seen a 6,000 acre rice field that's organic and that's not exactly pretty when it's all been plowed under to get ready for the next crop. And so what I did is when I was teaching that particular segment on that course on trees, I said, well, what we really need to do now is we need to uh, come up with an example farm of how do we produce our staple food crops from perennial plants. And I don't mean let's form a nonprofit and do research and write pretty papers for 100 years. Uh, let's actually go out there with the plants, do the breeding, do the work, do the layout, do the configuration, and let's run it as a profitable farm venture um, and see how it goes. And so this, this property is a result of a 2 o'clock in the morning agreement on a sweaty napkin in a sauna at a permaculture design course in Basalt, Colorado. Um, it, from the beginning, has been set up as a the land holding entity as a limited partnership. And then uh, all of the different enterprises that occur here lease land or buildings or space from the, from the partnership. And, uh, you know, our family leases the residential space and there's... We've got a guy who's doing the cattle, there's somebody doing the poultry and the, and the sheep, there's another person doing the produce, there's another person, Mark is the primary guy on the cider. So we all have our different enterprises, so this is like a rural uh, agricultural um, business incubator site. This building is the newest um, part of the, the, of the development of it. You think about it, you call a contractor, as soon as they show up on the job site, they can build a house in, in a month if they really put their minds to it. So getting a building built isn't a problem. It's not a challenge. It's been solved a long time ago. The biology, however, takes time. It's going to take time to get a 30-year-old tree to be 30 years old. So what we concentrated on early years was get the plants in the ground. Uh, plus, there's nobody doing breeding work um, the way that's really useful. They're doing breeding work in a manner that they can control the parents, and you get the offspring, and it performs that particular way. But if you start saving seed, it's not a... It's not a stable seed line. They control the plants. They have gleaming stainless steel factories and they're doing one flower, one you know, pollination kind of stuff. We need plants. Uh, we need them in the ground by the zillions because there's, what, seven billion people on this planet right now? We need these systems in the ground yesterday and not just in backyards. We need them broad acre across the whole entire planet. So our whole process starts, whatever plant we're using starts with a variety trials uh, selection phase and we'll plant like zillions of different varieties from all over the place. How many of you guys have read my book? Okay, so you guys are familiar with my now trademarked management technique called STUN, sheer total utter neglect. You put the plants out there and you don't really take care of them. And if they die, good riddance, because I'm not interested in the ones that need to be taken care of. 
Um, you can read books about how to be a master craftsman at your trade and have this one pepper plant uh, and give it all the conditions it needs so it fulfills its ultimate desti destiny as a pepper plant. It has the most beautiful, you know, whatever peppers. Like, look, we're growing tons of peppers. We're going to put 10,000 in the ground and not do anything to them. And then we'll go pick them. And the perfect ones get shipped off wholesale and the other ones get fed to the pigs. So the same applies to every single species that we're working with. Um, uh, before that, though, actually, before the breeding work, the very first thing that we did is we said, okay, well, where, where is this ecologically on the planet? Where are we located? We're uh, smack dab in the oak savanna biome. There's a little bit just like 50 miles north of here. It's kind of like the north, northern hardwoods. There's a lot of pine and uh, aspen starts getting thrown in there. And further west is more of the true, uh, true prairies. But the savanna is kind of like this mixing and sloshing form. It's not quite forest. It's not quite grassland. But it is its own separate entity. And so the um, main indicator species in a, in a savanna so that's our biome. We want to find the economic species, uh, preferably that'll stack one on top of each other. And the, the upper layer uh, in, a, in a savanna biome would, in this area would be the phagaceae, which are oak, chestnut, and beech. Underneath that would be growing um, apples and black cherry, uh, you know, the prunus and the malus. Prior to Europeans, of course, these were just the wild forms. Then hazelnut was the dominant shrub around here, coupled closely with wild plum. There were raspberries on the outside of this going out into the grass that grew all around. Uh, in the shade were gooseberries and currants, and there's grapes climbing all over the whole mess. Um, and the neat thing about the savanna biome is, is the biome that supports more mammal biomass than any other biome on the planet. So see, we had how many layers? We had like the, the canopy layer. So if we go phagaceae, apples, hazelnuts, um, raspberries, grapes, currants. Oh yeah, right, you got all this biomass. Now there's mushrooms decomposing it all. S mushrooms and then forage, but not just cattle. How about cattle and chickens and sheep? So there's 10 different crops growing in the same place. So that, that was the original model umpteen years ago and doggone it, it works. It really does. Um, but back to the building for, for a moment. The, the, uh, when we design a building, um, we design it to power itself and heat itself, period. That's just how you design buildings. No more, just start right here. Buildings heat themselves and buildings power themselves. That's all you have to do and figure it out. The designs are all there, the equipment's there, the technology's there since, been there since like 1940s. It's just people are choosing not to do it. One of the reasons, who's the energy guy? One of the reasons why they're choosing not to do it is the way it's being described. It's, uh, they're saying, oh, if you invest in like that wind turbine, for example, it actually had an installed cost of $75,000. What they do is they, they take this installed cost, $75,000, that you're making a capital investment in your asset. Um, then they're taking a current expense, your electric bill, and saying, well, if you were to pay off this asset with this current expense, this is how long it would take. Well, accountingly, that is incorrect. That's against accounting principles. You cannot take a current expense and use it to describe a capital investment. When was the last time you heard of somebody who renovated their bathroom and the first question out of their mouth, somebody else's mouth was, oh, what's the payback? It's like, that's not even a question because I'm investing in my asset. That's not even a question, what's the payback on the, on the uh, you know, remodeling of your bathroom. So you cannot use your current expense, your electric bill, to talk about an asset. Um, now if we want to talk about <laughs> the asset and the expense, uh, we had to refinance in order to get that and get this built. So we refinanced. We changed the mortgage from like a 7% uh, um, variable down to a 3% fixed. And the very first year out of the gate, uh, we're paying $4,000 a year less. So that sounds to me like it's more than free, right? If, if you're paying less money this year than you were last year and you get a building and a wind turbine out of it, that works pretty good. Well, then there was, there was a federal incentive money, there was state incentive money at the time, and the fact that most months we have all the electricity and then some that gets sold back to the grid. Um, so be sure you sort through the numbers and don't just listen to that first reaction right off the gate, you know, what's the payback? Another thing with the solar panels, a lot of people say the uh, solar thermal panels, well, what on earth are you doing putting solar thermal panels underneath an overhang? It's like, well, it's easy, so the sun doesn't shine on them. It's like, what? <laughs> well, then they're not doing their, performing their function. Well, they actually are performing their function because this time of year, we don't want heat going into the building. Um, 
In the winter time, the, the sun comes down below the overhang and it's shining more directly on the panels. It protects it from snow. I don't have to sweep them off or wipe them off unless we get a lot of drifting. Uh, another thing with the, with the solar thermal, because they're being described inaccurately again, instead of making an investment in my asset, they use this current expense, you know, so all the fastest payback if you do solar thermal is to connect it to your hot water. Well, there are people out here who have solar thermal in their floor and it's connected to their hot water. In the wintertime, they get no heat gain in their house or any hot water in their, in their, in their tank from the solar because the uh, temperature probe in here, when it's 20 below zero and cloudy, it's about 50 degrees inside that panel. Well, if you put the probe on your groundwater, it's about 50 degrees. There's no net difference in heat, so the pump never comes on. You don't gain any heat. Well, when it's 20 below zero and cloudy, when it's 20 below zero and cloudy and it's 50 degrees in here, I want 50 degree fluid running through the floor of this building. And so in the wintertime, this building doesn't freeze. It's not exactly comfortable when it's, <laughs> when it's 20 below and cloudy, but it doesn't freeze. This was about a third in crops, abandoned crop land, and then uh, the rest of it was uh, overgrazed pasture, a stalker cattle operation. They would bring in cattle and just like leave them here to fend for themselves, and he'd be buying some and selling some, never really knowing how many he's got, just keep buying and selling, buying and selling. Um, and there was only one little patch of woods um, that's down by our house, we'll see it. And so we started uh, with a lot more annual crops than we do right now. Um, from the beginning, we started growing uh, certified organic produce and uh, wholesaling it through Organic Valley. We were grower member number 24 in the Organic Valley Co-op, which now has like 1,600 members in it. Um, one of the great things about being a part of a co-op is the fact that it's a co-op and we all get together and we you know, pool our resources and we make things happen. And one of the worst things about a co-op is the fact that it's a co-op because we all get together and we mud wrestle out in the parking lot and scream and holler at each other. But at least we come back and we stick together again. Uh, so this is just a demonstration of, of alley cropping. Um, these are the flattest fields on the farm. Uh, and so these are the ones we've reserved for last. We still do uh, about three acres of annual produce and um, we've got two acres of asparagus. Look at the color of the soil here. Um, we'll see another patch down at the end. The soil when we got started here was all a reddish uh, clay. It wasn't like a really, you know, brick red clay, but it was a, a red clay type soil. Soil is created from the top up, not from the top down. Well, in 15 years of just using the subsoiler and uh, using lots of heavy grasses, we turn red clay into like brown dirt and it's like that deep. It's like, how do we do that? You know, and then below that, there's very little red clay anymore. You can dig like a two foot deep pit and not hit red clay. It's like, well, the red clay didn't go anywhere. We turned it black. Okay, so we made soil. Part of how we do that on our crop ground is with a, um, uh, a cover crop scheme where after our annual crop of produce, for example, we'll seed a winter rye or a winter wheat. Part of the energy equation is uh, I'm a part of a uh, oil cartel where there's a bunch of us that um, pooled together and bought an oil press and a trailer. It's all uh, done within in the uh, Organic Valley gang. And then uh, a number of us converted our tractors to run on vegetable oil and the whole internal fleet of Organic Valley runs on vegetable oil. And so growers in the group are producing oil. Many of them are using the oil direct. Some are selling to potato chip companies and other guys recycling it from potato chip companies, dewatering it, filtering it, and selling it back to us so we can run vegetable oil. It's rather simple. There's a, uh, the, the fuel doesn't burn. It, it needs to be hotter before it burns. So there's a heater band on the uh, fuel filter and then a heat exchanger that takes your radiator fluid, runs it through one side of a plate and the fuel on the other side of a plate brings it up to temperature and then it runs, it's a diesel engine. <clears throat> what I did here uh, to show the difference in scale because uh, a lot of people, especially most people in this country live in suburbs or cities. And so to see a scale like this is just flabbergasting. Well, let's take it back to the home level. If you were to do something like this in your backyard, that's a 15 foot diameter circle. That's a imitation of the oak savanna biome. There's oaks, chestnuts, apples, um, cherries, plums. I got uh, the wild prairie rose in there. Um, raspberries are in there, hazelnut obviously, and then just because we're also just south of the pine um, country up in uh, like the Toma area, I've got some pines on the north side. We plant a hundred of each 
species of nut pine. And only two survive at all because of the winters like slam the other ones and they die or they can't compete with the grass or whatever. <clears throat> all of a sudden, uh, one of these pine nut pines at year four starts to produce seed. Which tree do you think has the quickest uh, turnaround, the fastest reproductive rate of any of those plants there? So I go ahead and I save that seed and you plant that seed. Now my total gene pool is starting to get pushed in the direction of really fast reproduction. Well now a couple more years go by and now which one of these fast reproducing trees produces the most seed? That gets planted out. So all of a sudden you're selecting for the ones that produce the most seed the soonest that are pest and disease resistant with no work at all and no fertility amendments. I'd mentioned the key line design system. Uh, part of the strategy on this, this farm was to uh, couple every woody planting with a swale and a berm that uh, isn't perfectly on contour but actually goes from the valleys to the ridges. Now this is the valley going down that way to the main valley. That's a primary valley. Okay, education lesson. You want the film crew here on this one? Everybody take your left hand, hold it out in front of you. Uh, some people's index finger knuckle is lower than the others like yours right there, that's pretty cool. But the general overall direction of your hand, there is a main ridge that goes from the right knuckle down to the left. So this is some of the terminology you'll use. That's the main ridge. This is a, uh, a hill, a saddle, a hill, a saddle, a hill, a saddle, and a hill. Well now if we take another main ridge and put these together, the two main ridges meet in a main valley. And isn't it interesting that we're water organisms. Put your fingers together, this your knuckles that way, not that way. Yeah, that's, you could do that too. You're, you're flat. So here's this valley down the middle. Look at how the stream is a sinuous winding stream down the bottom of the valley. Well, this is a, that's the main valley, main ridge, main valley. This is a primary ridge in a primary valley, so on. Primary ridge, primary valley. What we do on this property is we take uh, in the primary valley, up as high in, in the landscape as we can get, we have a swale that goes slightly downhill at a 1% angle to the primary ridge. So the net effect of is if you pour the water on everything, it goes from the valley to the ridge, from the valley to the ridge, from the valley to the ridge. And what ends up happening is this primary valley will drain to this primary ridge, and this valley will drain to that primary ridge. So if you had originally poured water on it, the ridge, if it was one inch rain, uh, that one inch goes away. It doesn't soak in there, it's, it runs downhill. So the ridges actually get less than your normal rainfall. Your valleys get more because they're taking it from somewhere else. Well, with this, with this system, we spread it back out so those ridges get there one inch again. And what we've ended up doing a couple of different times in certain circumstances is we've flooded out crops out on the ridge. Um, the highest, driest parts of our property, we've had water accumulate and drown out crops. We'll actually go see some now. <clears throat> and we just used a two-bottom plow that made a simple little divot, and then it flipped over the sod and made a lump. Seems rather insignificant. Um, but it's dramatic. This, this one is 18 years old. This has been passively uh, keeping the water from going down that valley for 18 years. Now the water in this waterway here used to congregate down in the valley and in 600 feet in that direction, 600 linear feet, it would have dropped 100 feet, goes 30 miles an hour and there's erosion cuts all down there. They're all grassed in now that are uh, remaining from when they had grown uh, row crops here. So with a simple digging a hole in the ground, we're not making a dam, we're digging a hole in the ground we can stop this water as it's collecting at this particular point. And then you guys notice the little furrow in the berm that goes in either direction. This furrow goes 1,200 feet in that direction, turns a corner, it only drops 12 feet. So the same amount of water travels twice as far and it only drops 12 feet. It's still up on the ridge where I can use it for productivity in my trees. And because what's interesting about this, because we are not putting water into a waterway and sending it away. We're taking water out from the waterway and spreading it out across the ridge. And at, at night, you should hear the frogs going here. It's pretty cool. <clears throat> and another thing about amphibians, you guys who are going to be organic growers, um, if you do organic pest control, just remember that amphibians get about 50% of their oxygen right through their skin. And if you're using an organic insecticide to kill insects, you're going to kill the amphibians that kill insects. So since the 1840s, this was oak savanna. It would have been cleared, it would have been burned, it would have been brushed out and plowed, first with Norwegian bachelor farmers and then later on with 
you know, uh, with tractors and brush hogs. And then the, the highway crew now, they have these big, huge eaters that goes along the side of the road and chips it all up. And now they've got what they call a wet blade where they can grind up the brush on the side of the road while applying herbicide. And still, the brush on the side of the road keeps coming back, doesn't it? I think that that's a sustainable model for agriculture. If you can abuse it for 100 plus years, 150 years, and it still keeps coming back, that's sustainable, right? Um, this over here has two different species of hickory, cherry, uh, wild plum. There's mushrooms in underneath there. Don't go stealing my mushrooms. So right there, that's easy. There's 14 different crops growing all in one place while abusing it. So if we can get 14 different crops in one place while abusing it, why can't we strive for seven and take care of it a little bit? Most of us have this notion in our head that that's like this ugly brush on the side of the road, but that is way more productive than a cornfield. How much photosynthesis is going on in these cornfields around here right now? Close to zero. There's some corn up at least around here about this tall. Um, that's been photosynthesizing for weeks now. And it's not just grabbing sunlight from this little teeny tiny two inches out of the ground, it's grabbing sunlight from 100 feet up in the case of that hickory tree. You ever stand in the shade? What's the difference in the feeling when you stand in the shade? It's cooler. Part of what is happening, in, in, to, to think about it this way, uh, see how it's raining right now? Sunshine is like rain, except that it's a lot thinner. <clears throat> okay, so there's this, there's this sunshine falling down on us from the sky, and these, these plants capture it. So the total amount of photons that are striking the Earth's surface get reduced every step of the way, every step of the way, and every step of the way. By the time you're down here, there's just not enough photons around to have it be hot. So you want it to be cool? Plant more trees. You want to take carbon out of the atmosphere? Let's store it in a big, tall trunk like that, and under the ground, and in the soil, and in the roots, and in our livestock. A 1% increase in uh, soil organic matter um, makes that soil able to absorb um, 10 times more water. So a 2% increase 10 times 10 is 100. A 2% increase in soil organic matter stores 100 times more water. You can go through a drought and you can survive. It'll be all right. And it'll grow that much more, that much more biomass, which just, it just perpetuates the virtuous cycle. What other stuff that I want to say about soil? Oh yeah, all we have to do is increase the soil organic matter by 2%. The reason why I picked two percentage points. All, the, all of the uh, world's agricultural land, all we have to do is increase the soil organic matter by 2%. We bring the atmosphere down to pre-industrial levels of CO2. Easy. Key line, plant to grass, graze with animals, put in your woody crops, and then over time, we get our first knockback with the grass. Within three to five years, we've got our 2% organic matter while not having any less food in the food chain. And then over time, we develop these systems and we're taking even more of the gases out of the atmosphere. Let's not tell everybody it's easy. <laughs> the whole doom and gloom fear industry might go broke. 